Hello and welcome back to AEF TV in association with uh, Engerati. I am now joined by uh, David Taylor Smith, who is the uh, regional managing director uh, for Agreco in Africa. And um, we were talking a little bit uh, off air, David, and, and, and thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, I, I started the reportage from this event uh, at the beginning of the day with uh, PwC mentioning five mega trends. One of them is the appetite for inward investment. Mm -hmm. I then had a couple of interviews where I say, oh yes, uh, we're seeing inward investment. But those could have been transplanted to last year. They, they, they sound very much the same. Mm -hmm. um, we just had an interview which actually took that narrative a little bit deeper. Yep. And, um, you gave some background as to why things are different. Yep. The, the, the successes in South Africa about PPPs and yep. so on. And you've just done some research uh, as well. Can you take that narrative even further into a bit further depth for us and tell us what it has changed and why is this really different? Okay, okay. So what, the background for us doing some market research, and this was looking at the whole of Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan and Maghreb, is that we were seeing some quite messy trends. And messy trends in the market are different solutions of different size, um, with different success rates. And we were just trying to make sense of the IPP market in Africa. And if I just kind of describe the macro findings of that, and then kind of get into the guts of it. Mm -hmm. So the, the, mac the macro findings are, look, the power gap in Africa remains large. Uh, you know, you, anywhere between 28 megawatts in, in 2012 up to 49 megawatts, sorry, gigawatts in, in um, uh, by 2019. So by any measure, even if it's out, it's still large. And then we, we looked at every single IPP project across Africa, and out of the 120 that had been commissioned, uh, licensed, 60 had actually been commissioned. So you know, very high failure rate between licensing and commissioning. So then what we did is we dug into the guts of that a bit and said, well, you know, what, why are these failing? And there's some obvious ones like uh, inability to finance the project, political change or regulatory change. Uh, but quite often it was just simple economics and that you know, the solutions were coming out. Uh, the, average, the average tariff rate in Africa is four cents per kilowatt hour under the cost of production. So in other words, why, why, why would you start producing power if, you can, if you're going to get less than it costs to produce? And, so, uh, and, uh, uh, and is, sorry to interrupt, is that because of the, 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 the subsidy legacy? It's or, or mainly because of subsidies. Yeah. So, you know, the economics in a free market, you know, just don't apply if you're getting subsidized power. So then we dug under that and said, well, okay, let's look at the traits of successful IPPs and unsuccessful. And there, there are, you know, there are sort of three or four interesting conclusions. The, f the first is, and, our, and we come from it from a sort of specialising particularly in fast track power, uh, that the market for that, in our view, will remain strong. Because, you know, if projects fail to come to market on time, there's going to be a there's residual a need there's a gap. and yeah. it has to be filled quite quickly, particularly if there's a political issue that triggers that. So that was our first conclusion, actually. The underlying market's uh, fundamentals remain strong. Then you would say, OK, of this, of this group that are doing these IPPs, who are they? And should we partner them, ignore them, compete with them or acquire them or mixtures of? And actually doing that work, what we noticed is there's an interesting trend to doing smaller scale projects in a multitude of different consortiums using a multitude of technology, old and second hand. And I think that represents quite an interesting opportunity because our view is actually you can fuse what we do as a core product with some tradi more traditional technology associated with permanent power and you can produce some quite interesting models. So this is, a, this is like a blended power mix? It's a blended power mix. Yeah. You know, the advantage of, you know, if we, if we move towards programs like that is, you know, you get your power quickly, you sign a deal, instead of waiting for 36 months completion, you know, we can manage a lot of this on balance sheet, so the need for financing moves away. 
Uh, you can sculpt power uh, when it's needed over summer peaks or perhaps peaks when hydro isn't available. Uh, so I think, I think there's quite an interesting possibility of now looking at fusing what was our kind of core area with what was previously core areas for permanent power, you know, mid-speed engines and, and other and that, technologies. And, and that's an interesting thing that's coming out is that, okay, the, the agility of the tech to glue this together, which is kind of what you need, because yeah. you can't have the two things side by side and shout across, hey, you're turning off, I'm turning on. That, yeah. that, that's not how it works. Uh, but, the, but it seems to me that, and, and this is a macro thing that I've observed, that within the energy sector, those isolationary views of solutions are, are, are kind of, people aren't looking at it like that anymore. They're looking at it as a system. Whether, whether it's quite contained or big, they're looking at it as a system and saying, well, actually, if we have solar, we need, we need, we need to complement that with something that ramps quickly. Yep. We need to complement that with, if we can afford it, a storage facility or whatever. You know, the price for that is way too high still, but if you get a subsidy, then maybe you can afford it, uh, things like that. See, I, yeah. I would describe yeah. the same outcome, but for different reasons. Yeah. I, don't, I don't quite agree with your analysis. My, my analysis of that is on the demand side, it's it's quite chaotically organized in that you know that it's many of the markets in africa don't function as coherent markets they're d different people within an individual market uh, uh, market asking for many different things in many different ways and i think what the supply side has done is responded to that very entrepreneurial right so you have a mixture of really well established players through to entrepreneurs local entrepreneurs and international entrepreneurs playing into that rather mixed demand side. And the net result is you get this odd fusion of different technologies working in combo in a way that you wouldn't see in Germany because the demand side is very well structured, regulated and forecastable. Yeah, and I, the technology side that, yeah. is much more ordered. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think for those that are pretty agile and particularly if you've got a financing edge to it, because our analysis showed that most of the deals failed on financing issues. If you can bring a balance sheet to bear on elements of that, I think it offers some really interesting opportunities. And, and, and on that financing side, um, and this is again a narrative that was going through last year where I remember a couple of interviews about making projects bankable and, and so on. And, a lot of that seemed to be, be uh, to be about uh, skill sets and bringing the right actors together so that you can present the right business case. It strikes me that there are more organizations now, certainly I've met today, who are offering that ex expertise into the market than there were before. Is, is that true? Is, is, is that another thing that's creating a catalyst for more bankable projects or things? Um, I, I, I would go back to that description of the chaos rather dis makes, disorganized yes. demand side, very entrepreneurial, varying models, demand uh, supply side. And I think what, what that's leading to is many different models. So shorter period contracts, uh, you know, the, no the notion that a country, whether it be developed or developing, will know exactly what it needs for 20 years. So if you if you think of many many countries in Africa, or, you know, you know, what, what, trying to say, look, this is what we require for 20 years, mm. and you think of that in the life, the economic, see, yeah, the yeah, economic yeah. life of a particular country, yeah. and then having agreed that, you have to go and convince international banks to buy that vision and then say, okay, we'll lend you money for that 20 year concessionary period. I think much more convincing is to say, look, we can see what we need for five years. And you go to a bank and they go, well, actually the risks associated with that are much more bankable. Than and then after, a, uh, when we're on year three, we kind of look at the next five year period. Yes. And if you take a more modular view using some, you know, more mobile, Technology. Uh, it's a bit like a rolling contract. Exactly. Then, you can, then, like a, you can yeah. then say, look, you know, I mean, there's one country we're dealing with at the moment who've 
only been in existence as a country for less than 30 years. Right. And we're talking about a project where they're forecasting 20 years. So, you know, the ambition of trying to forecast ahead two thirds of the time you've been in existence is ambitious. But actually, if you broke that into five year chunks, I think it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's quite more bankable. And, you, and you'd end up with better solutions that met. It's like any. It's like any big thing. You break if you can break if you can break it down into little chunks. It's easier to wrap your head around it. Yeah, Le less risk on the demand side because yeah. they, they don't have to bet the house, yeah. and less risk on the supply side yeah. because they can supply without having to convince banks that they're about to bet the house on the supply side. Uh, so I, th I think it's. I think you know. I mean, if if you'd buy. European, North American standards, the market is quite chaotic. But actually, if you look at it in a different way, the market is very entrepreneurial. And, you know, I look after a portfolio that includes the whole of continental Europe. And trust me, there's many more interesting things happening across the African continent than in any European market at the moment. And, and I suppose it has to be entrepreneurial like that because you go through that phase before you hit any stability with, yeah. like with, with, with any yeah. business. So we're coming to the end of our time here and uh, um, what I w wanted to give you an opportunity to do because we touched on an, a, 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 a number of things and in that piece of research that you've done, is there anything else that, that, that either surprised you or, or validated an opinion you already had uh, just for us to sort of explore very quickly before we finish? Well, I, th I think the obvious one, which is, is well known, but it's just such an additional dimension you get in Africa that you don't get elsewhere, is electrification rates. So, you know, if, you're, if we're predicting what needs to happen in Germany, the assumption is everyone has access to electricity. You know, if you're predicting what needs to happen in an African country, and the, Africa, the, the general uh, level to access is about 38% now, or put that into another another means, about 570 million Africans not having access to power, mm. and then add to that more mobile phone subscribers than the euro, you've got this additional dimension. In addition to economic growth, you've got socio-economic growth as well. Yeah, and that that just doesn't exist to that level, and, and, and anywhere else in the, anywhere else in the globe. And and those two barometers, if you were to say to someone. I'm not going to, and you don't know what context you're talking in, about, and you're saying, I've got more mobile surprise than anywhere else, but I've also got this time. They seem to be at odds with each other, and but they seem to also point to only one direction, which is there is going to be more yeah. electrification, but the unknown is how fast is that going to yeah. happen? And but then go, back, go back to the supply demand side yes. analogy. Yeah. It's a perfect example. Yeah. So you've got an explosion in mobile phone use. And if you go to Kenya or if you go to Nigeria, people are charging their mobile phones in the most diverse entrepreneurial ways. Well, I've seen the picture of you know the solar panel and exactly. 20 charging points and this guy's just uh, it, you know, making a business not, out of that's it. That's not something you would recognize from France or Germany, no. No. but it's a super entrepreneurial way of responding to what's a demand then. And I think, I think that is such a unique additional dimension that you get in Africa that is just not present in any of the Americas or in Southeast Asia. You know, this additional push of more people wanting access to power for very practical purposes. Reasons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and on that note, we're going to have to uh, leave it. As, as pleasure as always uh, to meet with you. And uh, thank you as well for watching this. Uh, it's been a, a, another interview coming to the tail end of the first day of uh, AEF. I think you get you get a flavour of the trend. Uh, uh, the, the positivity from last year's big echo, but there's more substance, I think, behind uh, some of the assertions being made. Thank you again for watching, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again online soon. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Yeah.